All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Matt. So I work with the engineering communication program. We kind of uh, jump into different engineering disciplines throughout the, the university and kind of help people along with their communication skills. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you today about comes from my experiences with presenting at conferences and going to conferences and attending and sort of uh, some of the observations that I've made uh, along the way. So I just want to get a show of hands. I asked uh, Khadija and Judy about this earlier. But how many people have given a conference presentation before? How many people have never given one before yet? Okay, good. So we've got a good balance in, in the room. Some of you will maybe know what I'm talking about. Some of you are kind of going to give you an indication of maybe what you're going, going to see and how to avoid some, uh, some pitfalls that, that I've seen in my experience going to conferences. Okay, so um, to start, I just want to ask people, have you ever been in that situation where you're having a conversation with somebody, might be a friend, might be a family member, and they're telling you about everything that they've seen on Netflix, they're talking to you about a show, uh, they're going on and on about it, and they jump to another show, and they jump to another show, and you're like, what, I haven't seen any of these, what are you talking about? And you're starting to lose attention and trying to find like the closest exit to, to get out of the conversation. Have you ever had that situation before? See a lot of head nodding? Okay, so you have been a victim of the curse of knowledge. So somebody who knows intimately what it is that they're talking about uh, and is really, really excited about it has completely forgotten what it's like not to have that uh, information or that knowledge, right? And they kind of communicate in that kind of way. So, uh, so when you're communicating at a, a presentation at a conference, you know, everybody's going to be experts in something, but they're not likely to be exactly experts in what you're presenting on. So you have to kind of walk back to the beginning of your research and kind of remember what it was like not to, not to know. And that would be where I would argue where you start, okay? So we're gonna talk about three things today. So first thing is how to avoid the curse of knowledge when you're an expert. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about framing and introductions, because that's really important to step one. And we're going to finish off by talking a little bit about posters and just gen general visual design or visual rhetoric principles that will be useful for slide design as well. All right, so um, how do ideas survive, right? So I think this is a question you want to ask yourself as you begin preparing your presentation, because this should ultimately be the goal of your research, uh, it should be the goal of a presentation like this. You want your ideas to kind of escape that kind of private realm of research and theory and have an actual impact on the world, right? Um, for this to happen, you need people to remember those ideas. You need people to first understand those ideas, and that can be a, a bit of a challenge. So we're going to be referring a bit to this uh, book, Made to Stick, and it's all about kind of how ideas survive. So they've kind of these are uh, two social psychologists, and they've looked at some of what they consider to be some of the most sticky ideas, and they examined the communication uh, that was used to kind of help them get out of that realm of theory and into the world, okay? And that's where this idea of the curse of knowledge comes from, so their argument is this is one of the uh, single biggest barriers to the survivability of idea, particularly in, in technical fields where people are, you know, so immersed into uh, very complicated details of whatever it is that they're, they're working on. All right, so uh, I just want to walk through an example of this, so the electric vehicle, right? Awesome concept, right? Showed tons of promise all throughout its history, but there were many, many idea deaths along the way. It was, you know, feasible at some point that the electric vehicle kind of never would have uh, escaped that realm of, of theory. Right? So just a little quick history here. 1881, we had the electric tricycle. Right? Uh, in London, a couple of years later, their taxi fleet was uh, composed of electric, electric cars. Um, they had a range at this point of about 50 to 60 kilometers, so that's essentially U of T to Hamilton. That's actually pretty, pretty good, pretty reasonable for a taxi cab fleet. Um, but then, of course, the gasoline engine started to uh, gain notoriety and started to gain influence, and the electric cab fleet kind of disappeared and was replaced by gas-powered cabs. So, uh, electric vehicle, you know, had kind of a, a mini death there. So there were attempts to sort of bring it back. Um, 1961, there was an attempt to bring it back into the consumer market at this point. You can see the range increasing, kind of the design of the car, uh, matching modern design. But uh, again, obviously, this didn't really make much of a splash. 
Uh, a little bit later on, 1991, GM produced the EV1, 260 kilometers of range, that's pretty reasonable, I think, that's a, that's a pretty big trip, or a number of trips on, on one charge. Um, but again, it you know, never, really, never really hit it off. It took uh, Tesla in around 2008 with the Roadster before things really started to change. All right, so um, uh, the transportation researcher, uh, Sekaran Krishna, kind of suggests that there's a whole bunch of barriers to adoption. So some of these are kind of practical barriers. I'm not going to go through all of this because it's too much to talk about. But those practical barriers are essentially design barriers, right? Um, these things are kind of solved through research, through development. So these are issues with range, issues with uh, charging infrastructure, these kind of, kind of things that you need to overcome on a technological level. So once kind of engineers prove that this is possible, then you've got to convince people that this is possible to continue investing and to uh, continue um, showing interest. And this is a challenging thing to do. Uh, regardless of how, how good the technology was, you know, you have to convince people that, it actually, that your claims are actually true. And that's a hard thing to do when people have uh, this sense in their minds that you know, gas-powered engines is really the only way to go. So once you can overcome those barriers, you've got another barrier to overcome. These are those sort of emotional barriers that people have uh, with lifestyle and the products that they buy. And you know, uh, even if an electric car works, it does everything that engineers say it can. Maybe you don't think it's cool, or maybe it doesn't uh, satisfy your lifestyle. Maybe you just love the sound of the uh, rumble of a gas engine. So uh, when you're communicating this kind of technology, you have to overcome all of these things before your idea can survive. And, you know, you can say that uh, Tesla was innovative techn technologically, but I think, um, you know, an argument can be made that their real impact came from how good they were at communicating what they were doing, right? So they made electric cars believable uh, against this massive pressure from the gas lobby. They were able to kind of cut through all of that. Uh, they were able to kind of make the case that electric cars should be desirable, right? They did that through communication. Uh, and I think most importantly, they made the electric vehicle hard to forget because they had a very simple message from the you know from the inception of their of their company and their cars, and they stuck to that and just hammered that that through uh, until um, their vehicles started to make headway in the market. All right, so you're not selling selling cars. I don't want you to get the idea that we need to use like use carlsman or car salesmen speak in your in your presentations. But you do want your audience to remember and accept your work, okay? That's a really hard thing to do. So we're going to talk a little bit about some strategies um, for you to work towards that goal in your presentation. So you've all seen lots of presentations before. Um, you've probably forgotten way more presentations than you can remember. But uh, just think back to those presentations that you do remember, the really, really good ones. What made them memorable? If anybody wants to volunteer, I don't know how chatty this group is. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes there's the fact that there's a single message that's in a sense, it's very, sorry, that sounds like it is from the last slide, but yeah, some of them are a single point that's being transmitted that's very clear. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes um, if you're saying too much, you're not really saying anything anything at all, right? Uh, the information comes out scrambled. But if you have that single message and you keep that consistent throughout the presentation, that's one way that I think uh, presentations can be a lot more memorable. And you've probably all seen presentations that were trying to cover too much or the message was, was unclear and wasn't guiding all the information. Those are very easy to forget because they're very hard to tap into at the at the outset. Anything else? Yeah. Also the, the aesthetic of the presentation. I mean, not only for me, yeah. but also the images and the graphs and charts that, that are in there. I mean, too many text for me is not doesn't make there doesn't think I take for yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, the aesthetic of the presentation. I think relying on on images. Um, you're already going to be talking a lot. Why do you need to kind of replicate that with, with text? That, that's confusing. I think not very many of us can read a big wall of text, listen to somebody at the same time, read a graph, and do all that. So we want to. your audience wants to be listening to you, uh, and you can use images or simple bits of text to support what you're saying. So again, that's going to cut through all the noise and help your audience focus, help them remember. So good. 
Um, I'm going to just build on that a little bit. Um, so going back to, to this book, Made to Stick, I was talking about. So they kind of suggest six principles that make for really effective communication and help ideas survive. Uh, communication should be uh, simple, should be involve elements of kind of something unexpected, uh, should be very concrete, credible, uh, could leverage emotion, could leverage story. So we're not going to talk about all of these things today. Um, credible, I'm just going to assume your, your research is, is credible. Uh, so you've got that one in the bag. Um, emotion, story, and unexpected, these are, I think, challenging to use. I would say use them, but you have to use them with caution because if you don't use them well, these get into kind of like gimmicky and, and uh, can, can sabotage your presentation. But So we're going to focus on simple and concrete. These are absolutely critical to uh, whatever it is you're doing in the communication context, and they're really, really important to communicating well. All right, so uh, we'll start with simple. When we're talking about simple, this doesn't mean like dumbing down your ideas. You're, you, you're speaking to a very intelligent audience who's done a lot of uh, really important research, so you don't need to do that. What we mean, though, is really figuring out what the core of your main idea is, okay? And saying that as clearly and simply as possible. So I was going back to what you were saying about kind of having a very clear message that guides the, the presentation. That's in that core of the uh, idea. So one way that um, you can kind of incorporate the principles of simple and com concrete to grab your audience's attention is in the, your presentation frame. Um, you've probably, or you may have heard the word framing before when uh, you've heard people talk about what makes good communication. Um, I'm just going to turn to... Oops, turn to an article really quickly. So this was uh, an article written by a sociologist David Weaver, who is really interested in like public communication and public speech, I think his definition of framing is a really good one. Uh, so to frame is to select some aspects of a perceived reality and make them more salient in a communicating text in such a way as to promote a particular problem definition, causal interpretation, moral evaluation, uh, and or treatment recommendation for the item described. So, uh, I've already said you don't like to see a lot of text. This is probably coming off sounding like gibberish, so let's try to pull out the, the key points here. So, number one is salient. So, this base just generally means like how prominent an idea is, right? Uh, how much something stands out. And this involves like very careful issue selection uh, from all the information that you're, you're working with. The other thing to consider here is your uh, individual point of view. So you've got your salient issue, um, how do you kind of make it yours and how do you make it interesting, right? So there's an active interpretation that's happening there and how you go about treating that salient issue. Maybe you're trying to express a very clear problem, maybe there's something about the way you're evaluating uh, some of your information, but your point of view is very important to framing and you want to try to make that evident uh, in your communication. So um, what you're essentially trying to do with uh, how you frame a presentation is kind of develop a connection with your, with your audience. So when you're doing research, you've been doing it for, for years in many cases, you're kind of working with a lot of information, okay? But uh, your audience doesn't really want information, right? Uh, we're inundated with information every day. We need to make sense of that, right? We need to move a little bit beyond information for your audience to start paying attention and to start caring about what you're saying. So framing kind of creates that connection uh, so that eventually the information becomes meaningful, right? And that's what you, you want because meaningful uh, communication is what enables your audience to understand what it is that you're saying and to ultimately care about it what you're saying, and that's sort of the effect that you that you want to achieve. All right? Um, so introductions are kind of the first step into doing this, and I would say it's the most important step into developing a good, um, meaningful presentation frame. You can maybe coast a little bit after you've set up a, a really good in introduction. Shouldn't do that, but uh, introduction's the first step. You want to find a way to interest and engage your audience in that introduction. Be really clear about your your uh, research's main purpose. You want to kind of state a main claim that you're trying to make. Then give a little bit of a, a structure or logic for the presentation that's going to follow. So uh, we're just going to look at the first two of these for a second. Again, we kind of talk about how the frame is how you connect uh, your audience to what it is that you're saying. 
And you really want your introduction and the framing that you do in your introduction to incorporate these two principles of uh, simple communication and concrete communication, all right? So uh, I want to take you through a case and kind of look at how framing is used or not used in this presentation. So this was uh, a presentation that was given by a fourth year engineering science students here, here at uh, U of T. This was their, their final thesis presentation. So they had been working on this topic for the, the entire year, and they, they knew a heck of a lot about it, and they are very interested in it. So I just want to uh, give a little bit of context for the presentation. So it's going to be a lot like the Trans Transportation Research Board conversation or presentation. Basically, you're just trying to share a new idea, share some new research. Uh, one of your goals is to kind of get your claims accepted. Um, and you're also just trying to build a bit of community, right? You're trying to build a research community through the presentation. So that's what the student is trying to, trying to do here. Um, who's their audience? So uh, every student has their own supervisor, and the supervisors are kind of supposed to attend. So uh, experts in their field, but not experts in um, all the presentations that the students are giving. So they're coming in a little bit as novices uh, to some of the information here. There's other students in the room, so again, they've all been working on their different things. Uh, they don't know a whole lot about what each other's doing. They may have had some quick conversations about it, but certainly not experts. Then there was people like me. So, a communication instructor, I'm uh, part of the assessment team. I have no idea what the students are, are talking about. This is the first time I've ever heard anything about their presentations. Um, so, I think the tendency in presentations, or in this presentation, is to pitch to the supervisor. Uh, pitch to the person most knowledgeable about your field, but not always a good strategy. In this, in this case, uh, sometimes the student's supervisors aren't able to attend. The introduction we're going to look at, that was the case for this student, for this student. so he was essentially presenting to an audience who really didn't know much at all about what he was talking about. All right, so with that said, this is the, this is the opening lines to his presentation. I was able to kind of get a verbatim transcription of this, so just I'll read through this if it's troubling for you to read. The focus of my thesis project was to study optical injection processes in graphene. Optical injection is part of something called coherent control processes. Let me first start with defining what coherent control is. Coherent control is manipulating the final state of a system by excitation through two independent pathways. What I was looking at was optical injection. One of the ways to achieve coherent control is through optical injection, that is, exciting material with light or an elect electromagnetic field of two different frequencies. You can get some interference terms between one photon absorption at 2 omega and two photon absorption at omega, and can inject carriers and current. Okay, so, how's this for an opening for our presentation? I'm seeing people laughing, shaking, shaking their heads. Uh, probably not a good way to, good way to start, right? So, um, very smart, very smart student, very, very interesting research, but uh, yeah, he struggled to kind of package it in a, in a way that was going to be somewhat accessible. And again, really important that you do that at the outset, because if you do it well at the beginning, then you can kind of get into, into the details that may be a little bit more complex and confusing. So, so what's, uh, what's going wrong here? So one, you've got, you've got graphene, you've got this material. Um, do you know if your audience is familiar with this? I would argue, probably, uh, compared to all the other information that the student is talking about, audience is probably going to be most familiar with uh, graphene. So say something about that. Um, make something of what your audience already knows. Okay, why are you defining coherent control here? Is this important to your research? Why is it important to your research? How am I supposed to know, uh, having not done your, your research before or with you, right? Um, there's a lot of abstraction in this paragraph. They're talking about the final state of a system. It's a very vague, uh, very vague term, a system, right? It could describe literally, literally anything. What are these states all about? Um, again, more abstraction. We're talking about exciting material. I think the student is talking about graphene in this, in this case, right? So don't use those abstract terms. Think about um, what you're actually talking about. And I think the biggest problem here is there's really no order to the information. It's not presented in a logical sequence. It's not really building towards much. I mean, it is, but it's not done very well. All right, uh, so this student has fallen victim of the curse of knowledge. They could not remember kind of what it was like at the beginning of their project when they knew very little about this. All right, 
so what happened was they uh, you know, should have been working with the frame, but they didn't make it simple, and they didn't make it concrete, and they completely alienated their, their audience. So the feedback I got from uh, a number of the supervisors was, this was completely over my head. I had no idea what the student was talking about. That is the worst thing uh, that can happen to you when you're, when you're giving a, a presentation. And again, it doesn't matter how smart or accomplished your audience is, if you can't connect them to, to your, uh, your topic, they could have that experience. And it's, it's terrible if that's happened, and I've seen that happen at conferences so many times. So, so we've got to figure out ways to avoid this. So uh, here's a revision of that, that introduction. Um, tell me what you think about this. So graphene is an interesting material, the thinnest material known, and also incredibly strong. It exhibits useful electrical properties, which is why it is a material used in semiconductors. Uh, one unique and important property of graphene is its electrical response to light photons, which brings me to my research on optical injection processes, which allows us to manage, to use, sorry, to use managed photons to manipulate current and graphene structures. Better? A little bit better. You at least know what the student is, is talking about, right? Um, I don't think it's considerably dumber than the than the uh, previous introduction, um, but it, it, it uses a lot of techniques that make it a little bit easier to understand if you don't have any uh, prior knowledge of this, right? So first word is, is graphene, right? They're, they're pulling out something, and they're making it really salient for the reader, and they're pulling out the thing the, the uh, audience is most likely to be familiar with, right? You're drawing on your audience's prior knowledge. That's a good technique. Um, sorry, I already said that. Uh, so you've also got a little bit of subject treatment going on. They're telling you graphene is interesting. They're telling you like why you should start to pay pay attention to this. That's a, okay to do. Okay. Uh, they're also trying to use uh, concrete a little bit here. So um, they're telling you like let's say you don't have any prior knowledge of graphene. Uh, they're helping you visualize it a little bit. Really super thin material, uh, incredibly strong. That gives me some idea of of what graphene might be, okay? Uh, they start to develop a clear problem. So the, the idea here is that we need to figure out a way to uh, manipulate graphene so that we can, um, we can manipulate the current in the structure so it has these interesting electrical properties. Uh, again, simple, the core, the core of the idea is, very, is much more clear in this passage. Uh, and again, another use of concrete. So we're using something like a semiconductor. If you don't know what graphene is, you do know what a semiconductor is. So they're helping their audience tie in there. Okay, so interpretation is everywhere here. Framing is everywhere here. I think that's why I got a more positive reaction uh, than the first paragraph that we looked at. Okay, so um, kind of covered step one and two of, of uh, introductions. Step three, you want to kind of give the audience uh, a sense of the structure. So this is that last piece of last piece of framing, uh, because once you establish what your core idea is and what your your message is, you want to give your audience kind of a plan on how to carry that through the rest of the, the presentation, where you're going to be getting a little bit more complex and a little bit uh, more into detail. So you're probably going to provide something of an outline at the beginning of what your talk's going to be all about. Uh, is this a good outline to provide? Would this kind of serve your purposes? Got your background, methods, results. Is it good? Okay, it's, it's, it's okay. You know, it, uh, these are the functions that you're probably going to have to perform in your presentation. But it's also very uh, generic, right? So it's limited in its utility. So I could take this outline and I could probably put it into all of the presentations in the room. So it's not really giving me anything um, unique about the, the presentation. So a different way of constructing an outline would be to give some specific information about each one of these, these functions. So if uh, I see the word education and lung cancer instead of background, I kind of know right off the bat what the, what the present presenter is talking about, right? And I've got some concrete information uh, that's going to be easier for my brain to latch on to, right? Um, so these would be what we would call informative headings. So I would suggest trying to, trying to incorporate that into the structure of your presentation. And then you just essentially follow up on those, obviously, as you continue on with your presentation. 
All right, so uh, I want to do a quick activity with you guys. Uh, I'm interested in, in what you are all studying right now. Um, so think about the core idea of your research, whatever that may be, and just take a minute or two to try to write in concrete a one-sentence description of your research so we can share. This is a, a good communication challenge. <laughs> because um, the other thing that will happen at conferences, you're not just going to be giving presentations, hopefully you're going to be talking to people, you're going to be networking, and the first thing they're going to ask you, so, what's your research about? Tell me about it. Right? Got to have an answer ready. You want to start with that core idea. This was something I was terrible at. I found it. So. <laughs> I still don't. I still can't answer this question. <laughs> Ten seconds a minute is very fast. This is probably unfair. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, but it's just an idea. Yeah. There we are. Okay. Hopefully somebody will volunteer and we haven't just wasted an entire minute. Yes? Okay, so uh, we can please about how university organizational cultures can become more sustainable. All right, very, very simple, good way to start. Thank you, good. And I'm not an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was a challenge. Perhaps you have an advantage, I'm not sure. There's a challenge. <laughs> Somebody's got to win us that challenge. You know, you really do want to be able to say this statement. <laughs> One more person. Yes. Uh, okay, I explore the role of emerging technologies and trends on urban transportation emissions. So when I say emerging technologies and trends, it's things like electric vehicles or freight of delivery policies. Okay, good. Two sentences, that second sentence, I think, uh, was, was very, very helpful. Uh, gave some concrete context to emerging emerging trends. Awesome. Okay, so uh, fun fun activity, but yeah, as I said, you're going to get asked this question uh, at all the conferences that you go to, and it's good to have a, a, a nice zippy answer that's really going to make somebody interested in what you're what you're saying, so they want to continue the conversation with you. All right, um, so we're going to shift gears a little bit now into uh, visual rhetoric. We're going to try to talk about some principles that should apply equally to, to slides and posters. We're just going to start off with, with posters. Um, and, uh, I just, posters give, or should be arranged or organized, the content anyways, with a similar logical structure that you would be using in your presentation, right? So you'll have posters and you'll see uh, different section headings like this in a poster. Maybe not as generic as, as that, um, but it's a rational way to organize your content. But kind of how you arrange um, those, those sections or that kind of content can look very, very different. Uh, so you have a lot of choice there and you can make good choices and you can make not so good choices about how you arrange that, that content. So uh, at a very general level, <clears throat> most posters, most slides, most visual communication is essentially working from uh, a grid format. There's reasons for that, a grid is an inherently kind of rational structure, it's very consistent. But the other thing that's great with, with uh, about a grid, and starting with a kind of uniform grid like this, is it's very uh, modular, like it's very easy to manipulate, it's kind of like a sandbox, right? I can kind of combine blocks together, I can move blocks apart, I can delete blocks and throw them out, I can kind of move this around in an infinite number of ways until I can uh, create a, a visual path that allows me to communicate my information really clearly. Um, Grids have been around for a long time because they are so useful. So old newspapers uh, use grids to assemble columns, to assemble images, and to create kind of a rational order of, of information. And again, they were useful because uh, newspapers 
uh, back in the day, obviously there weren't computers, so it was, could be very expensive to move type around. Um, grids allowed you to, to have that modular effect to, to do that really easy. Uh, more visual mediums like billboards, same kind of thing, it all breaks down uh, to a grid. Websites, obviously, and if we look at uh, a website and the way it uses grids to organize its content, it doesn't even have to be words here, it doesn't even have to be images, and I kind of uh, intuitively know that each one of these boxes, uh, just by the, the simple use of background and foreground and white space uh, and color, these mean different things, right? I just automatically know that, so kind of leverage that to your advantage. So the other thing that grids are useful for is that they make it really easy to uh, incorporate other elements of visual rhetoric into your visual de design, whether it's slides or <clears throat> whether it's your poster. Okay. So um, these other principles that are going that we're going to talk about can be used to kind of amplify your meaning, to make the meaning more clear, to make your core message uh, stand out a little more. So once you've got that kind of organizational logic uh, established visually, how do you kind of make it, uh, how do you make the meaning come out? All right, so first thing to think about, again, a little bit more uh, relating to structure, is <clears throat> reading path, right? So um, European languages, at least, tend to read from left to right and down, left to right and down, and so on and so on and so on. And uh, a lot of studies that have been uh, conducted on how people read visual information find that people kind of use the same uh, same pattern. So when they look at an image, they tend to want to look to the to the upper left first and kind of want to read across, down and across, and follow this basic Z pattern. So um, don't fight people's natural tendencies in the in the development of your of your slide. Try to work with what people naturally do. Um, so here is a poster from I can't remember what the organization was called, but the U of T graduate research conference, I think, from, uh, from a couple of years ago. So they had a poster award uh, competition. This was one of the, the award-winning posters. I chose this one because it's a little bit more conventional than, than some, of, some of the others. You might be more comfortable with it. But let's just kind of see all the things that uh, I've been talking about and how this poster designer kind of incorporates them. So we've got our grid layout, very clear. Whoops. We've got our basic outline. So uh, if we look at the, the headings here, we've got a mix of generic headings and informative headings. So you can certainly, certainly do that sometimes. Uh, it's better to have a more generic heading in some places. So when you say like the uh, research gap, we all know what that means. Maybe if I use something a little bit more informative there, I may be a little bit confused about the function. Uh, if I put the research gap together with something more informative, maybe I run myself out of space. So you have to make these kind of choices. But you can also see um, more informative headings that are used here. So the last thing uh, to note is the way that this poster incorporates reading paths. So it uses the Z pattern. We're going to start in the upper left corner, kind of read across and down. The weak follow area and keep doing the same thing eventually until you get to the terminal area. But this poster is really interesting because I think it has two primary optical areas. It has two starting points. So um, they've, made, they've taken a lot of uh, effort here to uh, take what I think is probably the most interesting part of their research and put it right in the center of the poster and have it take up a lot of space. And you'll see that um, it's image-based. I can't remember who it was that says like the aesthetic uh, images are often helpful yeah, in presentations. So they've kind of taken um, that advice and incorporated it right here. So this is becoming a more kind of popular way, I guess, to design posters right now. Uh, it was something that wasn't done be before, uh, now more popular. And some uh, science poster presenters have gotten more radical with this and really just kind of focused on this central image and really limited uh, the text on, on either side of the, the poster. Um, you want your poster to kind of grab attention because people are going to be walking by you. And again, the idea is they're going to be having conversations with you. So it's hard to do that when you're trying to read through a ton of, a ton of text. Uh, an image can kind of help support that conversation. But then again, you might go for lunch. You still want your poster to communicate something, and if there's no text, it may be very difficult to, for your reader to make sense of, or sorry, for your audience to make sense of uh, your research without that. So, you know, I'd suggest maybe kind of striving for uh, for a balance there. 
Okay, so uh, moving on to another principle of visual rhetoric is this idea of visual grammar. So when we think about grammar, we think about language, and essentially uh, language breaks down, uh, or grammar and language breaks down to two things. It breaks down to components, so these are the words in a sentence, and then relationships, so these are maybe the, the word type or the order of the words, or the punctuation between them. So when you put these two things together, you get meaningful sentences. So I think uh, visual grammar can work in much the same way. So you've got components and relationships, just your components and your relationships are a little <laughs> different than they are uh, in language. So the kind of components that you might be working with, with visuals are like proximity, shape, color, size, foreground, background, entry, shade, um, relationships, similarity, contrast, hierarchy, etc., etc. You put those together and your visuals can communicate a lot of meaning without any words. Right? So, uh, can't talk about all of those. We'll talk about some of the ones that are, you're probably most commonly going to be using and will probably be the most impactful for the kind of work that you're doing. So, uh, here you can see how uh, size, shape, shade, color, proximity can be used to uh, create Contrast, which can be very, very important, especially when you're trying to work with that data and kind of craft a message using your using your data and the way you use visuals to depict the data. Um, lines are just another simple, uh, simple visual component that you can work with. You have so many choices between the width of your line, the uh, texture of your line, the type of your line, and each one of these things can signal different different things in your uh, in your work. Right? Again, another important thing to control when you're trying to develop uh, graphs for, for data. Right? So uh, if I wanted to kind of develop or show an equivalency between data, I might have lines that are essentially all, this, all the same. If I wanted to show a result or I wanted to emphasize or, or make an argument about one particular data point, I might use a, a colored line. I might make it a little bit thicker than the others. I've got to find some way to make it stand out. Okay, so you can play with all of these things to help kind of gain better control over your meaning. So uh, here's a poster, uh, I think that is a really, really good example of elements of uh, visual grammar. This is from a few years back, so uh, if anybody remembers uh, Rob Ford's heyday in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, so one of the big things he was campaigning on as he kind of moved into office was uh, Proposing a subway plan to try to squash David Miller's plan for the uh, the proposed LRT, and uh, he thought this was a great idea, and nobody else did. Uh, so the Toronto Environmental Alliance kind of came up with this poster to make that argument that um, the proposed subway expansion plan is a terrible idea, uh, and this was the poster that they they came up with. So have a look at this and kind of try to pull out some of the different elements of visual grammar that uh, this poster designer is using here to make their argument. It's not a whole lot of words here, but I think the message is crystal clear. Yeah? It basically shows how the originally proposed plan is lacking in terms of coverage. So okay. it's kind of very apparent that, the, okay, when someone looks at it, that's better. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's very it's very apparent that the transit plan is better, but how are they, like, what visual elements are they using to lead you to that conclusion? The same colors for the uh, lines, basically. Okay, good. So they're using the same the same colored lines, right? So it, it draws your eye to make an uh, a comparison. What else are they doing here? A lot of neat little things up there. Yeah. The, the font thickness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Font thickness is a, is a big way that they're conveying meaning. What else? Take one more. It's using the numbers in the exact design of the numbers, like you automatically know what to compare, what they're looking at, and then the text, how big they are, and their position that they hold. Yeah. So your eye with art goes to the comparison right away. Great, yeah. So size, position, it's uh, creating a relationship of, of similarity. Class, yeah, good, good. Yeah, so there's lots of, lots of stuff here, right? Color, shape, uh, type. The way they're using white space, line, so this is a, a very critical line in the, in the argument, size, and it creates, all, and it uses all these different relationships that you guys are talking about. It uh, makes a very crystal clear argument without having to write much or use any text uh, at all. So very, very effective. Um, no, apparently not. 
Yeah, no, apparently not. <laughs> there were other things happening in, in Toronto at this time, if, uh, for those of us who remember wild, wild times in Toronto. <laughs> but uh, the message is clear, right? All right, so uh, I can't believe how fast we've been going here. Uh, just about out of time. Uh, I was going to finish with one uh, activity. So this was a poster from a previous uh, Transportation Research Board, Board conference, and I was going to have this kind of work, uh, spend a little bit of time trying to use visual uh, design elements and framing elements to try to improve this poster, but I don't think we have time for, for this. So uh, I'm going to just conclude with uh, a couple of points that are uh, especially for those of you who have not presented at a, at a conference before, can, because the first conference presentation can be a little bit in, intimidating. So I'm going to try to tell you not to be intimidated. So a couple words of advice. Um, number one is you are the expert, right? So you know what you're talking about, but as I said at the beginning, this can be both a blessing and, and a curse. So don't feel the need, uh, or don't think that like your main goal in the presentation is to show how smart you are. Your main goal is to share your uh, your research and, and help your audience uh, understand that and to find that interesting. Okay, so but everybody's gonna think you're you're smart. You're smart, right? Don't worry, don't even worry about that. So uh, the next thing is, some of us are just natural speakers and can jump into something and just speak off the cuff, no problem. Uh, some of us need a little practice. I'm definitely one of those those people. So uh, just. Do practice these presentations, get comfortable with what you're saying, get comfortable to the point where you think you can talk, say it a hundred different ways depending on the context, but it's going to come out like fairly clearly uh, no matter um, what, you, what you say. All right? Uh, the other thing is, I think this is especially important with visuals, is get a second set of eyes on them. So show your visuals to someone else, uh, do kind of test with people and, and Try to deduce whether or not they understand uh, what your message is from the from the slide and from the poster at a at a high level. This is really important to do. I think it's easier to control your message in text. It's a little bit harder with uh, with pure visuals. Uh, yeah, and the last thing is is to try to relax before you give your presentation. Try to enjoy. <laughs> Try to enjoy it. They can be. They can be fun. You get to meet a whole bunch of new people. You get to see a whole lot of, of new ideas and the cool things that people are doing. It's a really, really good experience. I may not need to be telling you this. Maybe you're cool as a cucumber. It's it's nothing to worry about. But uh, it wasn't for me. So uh, basically, the point of my presentation here was to kind of share my experiences uh, of of conferences with you and and uh, how to get through them as successfully as possible. So that, uh, that wraps up uh, what I had planned for you guys today. Uh, do you have any, any questions?